Hello and welcome. You're watching IndiaPostLive.com. Braggadocious, bestie, scientificness. Well, you think I'm talking slang? I plead not guilty. These are words that have actually been added to the Oxford English Dictionary in 2013 and 14. Did you know that every 98 minutes a new word is created in the English language? Take a look. You see, sir, I can talk English, I can walk English, I can laugh English because English is a very funny language. It's fine to poke fun at it in popular Bollywood films. But in reality, there is no putting a cap on modern English. It borrows and uses words from different languages across the world. And why not when a new word is being coined every 98 minutes in the language? At this rate, 14.7 words are being added to the language each day. Whoever says, I ran out of words. But what makes this language click? And will it remain as relevant in the days to come? What makes the English language click? Well, we are going to have a conversation on the King's language. And I'm joined in the studio by Professor Krishnanunni. He is uh, a professor of English in De Delhi University, teaching currently at the Deshbandhu College. I have with me Dr. Poonam Khokhar, who is the director of Inlingua Noida. She teaches spoken English and she prepares students for IELTS and TOEFL. And I invite people on Skype, I invite all of you to come and join us, join the conversation if you have something to say about the English language and the fact how these new words are being used and uh, are being added and what kind of an impact it is happening, uh, is happening on the language itself. Please join us on India Post Live. You can tweet us your comments, hashtag India Post Live. Uh, in fact, we do have uh, someone on Skype. Uh, he is uh, KG Srinivas and uh, he uh, has been in uh, the publishing uh, for many years and currently he's the editor-in-chief of Creative Brands. Srini, welcome to the conversation. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, Srini, I'm Nilanjana and I'm joined by Professor uh, Krishnanunni and Dr. Poonam Khokhar. So we are going to be talking about the language and, you know, uh, English is actually the third most spoken language in exactly. terms of the native language. Yeah. Uh, however, the fact that, you know, I think uh, every 98 minutes a new word is added to the language, doesn't it make the English language the world's first truly global language? Of course, uh, here uh, the discussion is primarily centered on how English has become a kind of global language. Yeah. But I think there is a necessity to define what exactly is the concept of global means. Uh, for me, there is a turning back, there is a journey back to, uh, you know, the early tenets of globalization, uh, which goes back to the expansion of the empires right from the uh, end of the 18th century, which means precisely by the end of the rationalistic Europe, yeah. where English was not at that point of time a very powerful one, but grand Actually, the coming up of the colonies, the Britishers started moving out and the coming up of the colonies at various places, particularly in India, this has created a tremendous impetus uh, for various kinds of inflections to come into English language. So what I mean to say is English never was, uh, you know, a kind of peculiar English right from, uh, you know, the colonial times. This inflection started coming up. And um, when we look at the 19th century, this is a very particular, uh, you know, historical juncture. Hmm. Uh, the standardized English began to change rapidly due to thousands of reasons. Uh, in most of the colonies where Britain had, uh, Britain had a colony, right. uh, these colonies started imbibing a lot of traditional, cultural, and also non-native, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of idioma, idioms and the rest of the things into English. So, uh, particularly in the context of India, I would like to point out certain things because Sahib became, uh, you know, yes. an, uh, an English word yes. right from the 19th century, though Sahib is used uh, in literatures and in, uh, you know, in uh, other writings of English in the 20th century, but it was very much there by the end of the 19th century. Uh, same with, uh, you know, thousands of other native, uh, you know, connotations that had seeped in English. So in one way, what makes English the global uh, language are these kinds of inflections that had happened and we need to open up, uh, you know, uh, for a mature discussion. So uh, do we have a standard English becomes the central question. Do All we right. have a standard exactly. English? All right, let me let me talk to uh, Dr. Poonam. You have, uh, you teach students on how to, you know, excel at IELTS and TOEFL and these are, this is a standard form of English, right? What are the challenges you face? 
these days thanks to uh, the internet yeah. and also the SMS. Yes. So uh, lots of, uh, I mean IELTS has, is supposed to be the benchmark. Yes. And formal English is needed. But then we find students using SMS language without the vowels. Yeah. So that is at times really, uh, you know, uh, we feel they are kind of abusing the language or what is happening to the language. So what is that happening is, to yeah, the language? That is the, a concern, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. Srini, uh, let me bring you in here. Uh, you know, we cannot really talk about English without talking about Shakespeare. Now, during Shakespeare, <laughs> During Shakespeare's time, we had about only less than 100,000 words. Today, that number has crossed 1 million. Uh, and a lot of informal English has been added to the language. Does it hurt your puritanical sentiments? Uh, could you come again? The question, you answer? Could you come the, again? The, qu the question is, the fact that so many informal words are being added to the language, does it affect your puritanical sentiments? Do you feel kind of uh, surprised and not in a very nice way? Uh, actually, not at all, you know. Huh. Uh, yes, uh, perhaps uh, with the advent of uh, the computers, the internet in the 1990s, uh, and, and, and the kind of... Uh, uh, shrinking words, etc., etc. Well, some of us were really uh, kind of taken aback because it's sort of an affront to what we call the sensibilities, yes, uh, uh, language sensibilities. But I think today, 20 years down the line, uh, I think a lot of us have uh, accepted this transition, you know, into abbreviation of words, you know. Uh, as, as, as we said, talked about the SMS generation and all of that. Hmm. Uh, so in terms of uh, progression, I think uh, it, was, uh, it was natural, it was logical for this state. And I, I don't think it's, it's, it's entirely uh, logical or rational to say that, you know, our uh, sensibilities, we take a front you know, to this uh, generation of uh, abbreviations and uh, rather informal expressions. That, I think, was an inevitable uh, stop, inevitable um, uh, point in the progression of uh, the use of English language. But don't you think, Srini, as uh, Dr. Poonam pointed out, there needs to be a clear demarcation. You know, how you write English, uh, you know, uh, probably in an article, in a letter, you know, in, in, in a formal manner, and how you write English when you're speaking on the mobile phone, don't you think there needs to be a clear demarcation between the two? And don't you think kids today, young people today, young adults, in fact, that is also a new word in the dictionary, young adults, don't you think they are losing out on the original spelling? They are forgetting original spellings. Don't you think yeah. that's a concern? Yeah, in fact, you know, uh, it's happened to uh, You abbreviate and use the short forms for yes. so words. And uh, we do end up committing, you know, spellers when yes. we actually formally write something. Yeah, but I think it is essentially uh, a very cultural thing today. You, know? uh, you see a lot of youngsters, for example, when they write to us, send us mails, for example, for a job application, yes. you know, uh, TV, uh, you'll see that the approach is far more laid back. Very, very, very informal. Yeah. And uh, today, when I receive such a such a CV or such a letter, an email, uh, I look at the overall sensibility. You know, now that may not uh, uh, the, the informality of the mail or the choice, the diction of the mail may not necessarily reflect the uh, the true personality of the person behind the email. Oh, are you, all right, all right. Let me let me so just that, get let me. Let me get the reaction uh, to that from uh, Professor uh, Krishnanunni. Yeah, I. Srini, do you have? Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. <laughs> I, I agree with uh, Srini to a certain extent, but what, what really happens is uh, when we are looking at, um, you know, from an academic perspective or from mm. a literary perspective, uh, these kinds of SMS languages, these kinds of, you know, uh, the, uh, the super globalized and highly innovative kinds of, you know, short forming, mm. short forming of a major context or, uh, you know, a phrase or something like that, this creates an absolute uh, ruckus, uh, you know, for, for almost all the academicians because when we, 
evaluate certain papers, this becomes very clear. We are getting papers like um, Shakespeare's As You Like It, where students are writing you, uh, you know, why you Exactly, why you is completely taken out and a big you comes. You know, <laughs> this this is absolutely, uh, you, you know, a negative tendency when we look at an elaborate writing. But at the same time, as Srini pointed out, there are certain uh, certain aspects which we have to agree with that. We are we, we can't uh, make it cha open challenge against, uh, you know, the new tentacles of, uh, you know, these kinds of languages which are springing up. And uh, academics have changed totally with respect to English. For instance, we are having courses on business literature, we are having courses on technical writing. So in our own case, you know, there is one class on Shakespeare and the next class we have to teach a technical writing course. Uh, uh, you know, in this course what we do is totally different. We need to go to the black, uh, take a chalk, go to the blackboard and uh, tell the students, you know, how they have to prepare a resume or how they have to prepare a kind of you know, business letter or whatever. So these are the students who are not uh, literally, uh, literature-wise motivated. So mm. there is a huge difference when we look at uh, you know, the, any third world country for that matter, when we look at this, this kinds of academic scenario. On the one hand, there is a huge chunk of students who are going for this, uh, you know, these upcoming courses like uh, technical writing, communication, business literatures or whatever. So this is the class which is meant for some kind of, you know, highly sophisticated mechanisms and the rest of the things. But at the same time, the real class which uh, really want to live in literature, hmm. all right, they, are the, they are the students who are stuck with these kinds of, you know, language. So there is an in-betweenness. In-betweenness, <coughs> I would like to state um, <coughs> that on the one hand, uh, students try to veer towards uh, the new new language. At the same time, they have a difficulty uh, to keep in, uh, you know, uh, to, uh, uh, when they try to, to practice, to, uh, yeah, any kind of, you know, elaborate or, hmm. uh, you know, these kinds of writing. Hmm. English, to a certain extent, is becoming more and more analytic. And I would like to say that this, this, this is, um, a tremendous influence from the uh, rise of the soap operas, you know, in England, which, uh, you know, particularly from the 1960s. 60s in England, I'm not talking about the colonial countries, the, the post-colonial nations mm -hmm. or whatever, mm -hmm. like India or uh, Africa or even, uh, you know, West Indies or whatever. The soap operas in England, uh, uh, when they started, uh, the soap operas had a tremendous impact of, you know, new kinds of symbols uh, which came. So language became no more, uh, you know, a particular structure, even a kind of sign, even a kind of symbol also started, you know, getting into this language. And suppose if an Englishman says quick, uh, there is another guy says quack. So this quick and quack, uh, you know, through these uh, soap operas, it created a huge, uh, uh, you know, impact. Uh, uh, to a certain extent, BBC also fo uh, started following this. And in fact, you know, um, th there was an article recently in the Time magazine where which said the empire right, strikes right. back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, where <laughs> but but English, as as we have kind of we all agree that English is a global language. Um, with time, language is also evolving. Terrible why don't you, uh, Dr. Puno, why don't you tell us about the breed of students that are coming to you to to, to learn English, essentially. Well, actually, English, uh, because of the multinational culture these days and job opportunities, so English it has become very important. Hmm. So, uh, students coming out of engineering colleges and if working people, you know, if they are looking at <coughs> promotions, uh, uh, you know, better prospects, hmm. they need language, they need English. And uh, I think that's uh, the beauty. Of English is yes, it is evolving. It is evolving day by day. You know, it uh, takes in all the languages, whatever words we just talked about. Mm. You know, every day we are adding. Well, so many words are added. But mm. then, uh, even though on one hand we feel uh, this is something uh, which is spoiling mm. uh, the way English was, but then uh, on the other hand, I think that is the beauty of the language. The inclusive nature yes. of the language. Srini, that your is comments? why English is English. Yeah, English is English because of its inclusive nature and the fact that it allows itself to evolve. And uh, Srini, I also want to ask you besides these comments, you know, in a situation where you have only 140 characters allowed on a Twitter handle, yeah. what, what does people do? What do people do? I mean, they have to adhere to that and they have to make their point as well. Your comments, yeah. really. Uh, yeah, a couple of uh, things. Yeah, on the Twitter, of course, uh, you got to be um, probably highly skilled, you know. Yes, uh, that's a different skill uh, set altogether. Yes. <laughs> yeah, which, which, uh, which I think is a, it's a good challenge, you know, a good challenge, really. And uh, some of us, uh, you know, the remnants of the 1990s, you know, would have found it difficult to express in those 140 characters what we wanted to do effectively. 
Yes. However, you know, I just want to make a couple of quick points. One is uh, what Professor Fashuni talked about in betweenness. You know, yes. Uh, uh, the current uh, current uh, generation, or rather, the way uh, we speak or practice or the language is taught, uh, uh, a lot of uh, the current generation seems to have caught in, in this state. You know, they're not really quite grounded. You know. In, in, in basic principles of, uh, of the language, maybe grammar or ideation, you know, all of that. You know? So uh, the, the language takes a big, big hit. You know? And to that extent, I think a lot of youngsters today are, are, are very handicapped. So you think people of, who have not learned la English grammar in school, people who yeah, for yeah, whom English has yeah, not been the first language, yes. are you talking of those? Very, very simple things, like, you know, when uh, the people do not know, uh, the difference between a lot of people do not know the difference between a few and few. few. For example, you know, yes. very basic, which we learn back in school. Yes. However, then, then I think that's that's probably a function of how the language is taught today. Yes. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, the language is technology mediated. You know, so uh, a lot of these things probably uh, fall between the two stools. You know, of uh, expediency on one hand. And on, on the other hand, of the necessity of learning language. Right? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I asked you about you know the fact that uh, what in fact Srini made an interesting mm. point some time back. He said that when people uh, apply for a job and when they use such language, he doesn't mind because he does not uh, really credit the person with that kind of a personality. He would rather meet them and interview them and then uh, you know uh, make a judgment uh, for himself. Let's uh, you know talk about a little bit of uh, you know the discourse analysis uh, yeah. theory where language making yeah. society and society making right, language. Right, right, right. Uh, discourse analysis is a very important uh, aspect, uh, you know, when we look at the evolution of English language. Mm. Uh, there, are, there, are, there were three fundamental stages in the, the discourse analysis. Uh, the discourse analysis itself began as a branch from the 1940s, and later the modality of the discourse analysis changed when we started looking at the etymology of each and every word. Uh, very fascinatingly, what happens in a post-colonial English language is the fact that some of these words don't have a particular particular etymological context. All right. So where do we find etymology? The etymology is like become. okay. Right. Okay is the most recognized word on this planet. And yet nobody is really no, sure about where the where word the comes word from. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you were saying. So, uh, so this, uh, yeah, I was uh, talking about this etymology. Mm. And um, so in such a context, uh, even uh, the discourse analysts, uh, you know, are facing a major hurdle. Okay, where do we go from here? Uh, so one way of comprehending this problem is, uh, you know, I am, I, I am in touch with some of these, uh, you know, brilliant discourse analysts, uh, you know, from Cambridge and Oxford. So they told me that, um, Certain words have certain tribal connotations, mm. which obviously the standard English people never used to accept because they never can believe that it's from a tribe, very distant tribe, maybe from Uganda or from uh, Ghana or from even uh, you know certain tribes in Kerala. These things might have turned up, but the point is gradually, uh, you know, they have to accept the fact that this is this has a tribal connotation, but this uh, has become a kind of a cosmopolitan. Uh, all right, way of uh, that again know, goes addressing. to speak for the inclusive nature. Yeah, inclus of the uh, inclu inclusive nature. Hmm. So uh, uh, the the so-called Queen's language, yes. you know, has come is is no more. Yes. So discourse analysts uh, right now are taking the third step. Uh, you know, they have uh, to a certain extent forgotten the etymology. But while uh, you know not completing forgetting the etymology, they try to make some kind of a balance sheet. You know where exactly we do fit all these things. I, I can give you one quick example. Uh, at a time when I was doing my research, uh, you know, uh, there were some research scholars who were using the term, you know, still saying uh, time pass. But time we know pass, the, yeah, okay. but we know the we know that time pass is not a standard English. If you are writing time pass in a research paper, all right, it will be marked, uh, you know, with the red pencil if it's a, if it is under a good research scholar, mm. okay, a, a professor. Uh, actually, the, uh, the 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 term is past time, P A S T I M E. But now time pass is very much there in the Oxford Indian, Ox, uh, you know, Oxford in, uh, English. Um, you know, the, so gradually people have accepted this. 
So the discourse analy uh, analy What does that say for the people? What does that say for the English speaking people? Yeah. The fact that English is no yeah. longer as intimidating uh, yeah. as a language earlier, now that people exactly, can very easily a, just come up with the language and it yeah. gets accepted? Yeah, exactly. There is a huge challenge against the so-called standards, standardization of the English language and the so-called pe people who uh, still sit at the pedestal and claiming that, okay, uh, we used to uh, have this kind of an accent or something like that. And apparently I've been, uh, you know, telling my friend that even, I've noticed several times that BBC BBC highly is getting at times Americanized, so following mm. the pattern of CNN, mm. which unfortunately was not there in our teen, teen when, when I was a teen, well, during my teens, because we used to have this uh, typical accent from the side of the BBC. So, uh, if at all someone used to say reservoir, we used to say reservoir. Hmm. All right, these kinds of BBC accent was quite important at that point of time. But now it is. But now you have words like clunker. Clunker. A word like accent. clunker is yeah. included in the English dictionary. It means a dilapidated car. Yeah. Right. I mean, I for one really would not uh, associate a word clunker with Oxford. Right, 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 right. But I'm so, sure the young adults today have no problem with it. I mean, uh, if a word like bestie yeah, can be used. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, Srini, uh, let me get your uh, comments on that. Yeah. Uh, a couple of uh, quick things to add to what uh, Professor Kishnani said. Uh, I wanted to situate uh, the idea of uh, discourse analysis um, in terms of, you know, for, for, for cultural production. Uh, uh, we live in hypersexual times, you know, uh, for, for a variety of reasons, you know, uh, for, for the kind of uh, media exposure we have, the kind of uh, literature we have around. Uh, I think there's a certain amount of hypersexuality in even in, in, in the way we speak. Uh, a simple thing like the use of the word fuck, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's acceptable. You know, it's no longer, uh, even in formal situations, uh, a lot of people seem to, be, to accept it, you know, uh, as though it were like saying good morning or good evening, you know. So a fuck has become acceptable. In fact, I was attending a, 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 an annual conference the day before, and uh, one of the one of the senior leaders uh, he said, "Shut the fuck up." He was saying, "You know, this is what we should be saying to people." We should be so saying I, this to people. Is that what he said? If, if, if the things don't work, so uh, I would be offended by it, Srini, if somebody no, told me objectionable. You know, I, I cannot accept it. Now I cannot accept it. Was, I cannot I accept it. Was, yeah, my point was, you know, now words like "cunt," you know. Count, countish, uh, uh, you know, things like that has now come into parlance, you know. And I find it, uh, to my mind, for example, if someone describes someone as a count, and I find it extremely uh, unacceptable, you know, derogatory and violative of uh, uh, essential human you sensibility. Know, Dr. Poonam just was making that point. She's saying that the English language is becoming more abusive and derogatory. derogatory yes. So th that is exactly what Srini is talking about. Definitely. Tell, tell me, tell me how your students uh, talk to you. I mean, how, are they as respectful as uh, we were in our generation? No, or? no, 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 no. Uh, we were a lot more, uh, you know, formal and respectful mm. for our teachers, our professors, and mm. now, you know, they come to us more like friends. You know? mm. And uh, also, uh, when we look at uh, the the Facebook and Facebook and mm. uh, such um, sites, mm. uh, all the students are your friends. Mm. They're yes. in your friends list. So mm. that formal thing, that respect, that distance, somehow. Uh, doesn't exist now. And you think language has a major role to play in that? Definitely, language does have. From a Queen's language, it has become a common <laughs> language, I think. So that is. Somebody just it. commented that, you know, yeah. English is actually an Indian language. Indian because, language. Yes. You have words like Jai Ho, words Samosa. like Slum <laughs> Samosa, right. Is there in the Oxford Dictionary? Samosa is a word in the Oxford Dictionary, something I probably couldn't imagine uh, when I was in school. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, let's talk of this film English Winglish, you know, mm -hmm. where you had a husband constantly chastising his wife for not knowing English. Uh, how do you think, how important has knowing English language become in uh, today's society? It has become very, very important because we deal with students every day. Yeah. Uh, I mean, our students, uh, uh, the age group we deal with is from 14 up to 60, 60. Mm -hmm. We've had uh, grandparents coming in to learn English just because they want to go to some foreign country and be able to talk to their grandchildren. Hmm. So, uh, there are needs, yes, but then uh, English, uh, we cannot deny it. it's, it's become the language and it is uh, one of the, the necessity 
to get a job, to get a status, uh, anything. Mm -hmm. Coming back to Shakespeare, like I said, you cannot talk about English without talking about Shakespeare. Shakespeare yeah. The language is 175 years old right. and Shakespeare himself right. uh, invented mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. 1700 words. Right. Right. Tell right. us a little bit about uh, yeah, Shakespeare, Shakespeare in English. <coughs> Shakespeare in English is a very interesting, uh, you know, subject. Uh, to a certain extent, Shakespeare's English also uh, was not the real English, to, uh, you know, yes. or due to, due to uh, you know, Shakespeare's own uh, knowledge of the Latin and that was those were the Renaissance was was a time when Latin and uh, you know Greek were uh, you know commonly taught in most of the British schools. Uh, British unions ha also had these kinds of you know Latin learning, yeah. and uh, Shakespeare's own sources he had taken the sources from Plutarch, and uh, except one play uh, out of the thirty six plays which he wrote, uh, except one uh, you know the rest all plays are not Shakespearean plays to a certain extent. The, the themes and the plots uh, fundamentally are uh, you know have been taken from the history and all. So, uh, Shakespeare's own, in, in, uh, you know, invention of the language was very, very funny. For instance, uh, there, is a, there is a word, which big word which is coming up, which is still there in the uh, English dictionary, uh, uh, you know, that, uh, 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 which has, uh, which doesn't have a particular connotation or a particular meaning. Tudini uh, tatibus, uh, it goes like that, honorificably tudini tatibus. This is a word, which, a word. Yeah, this is a word which comes in a Shakespearean play. Okay. Honorificably tudinitatibus. Hmm. So this word, if you carefully look at this word, it has Latin, it has a bit of Greek, it has a bit of English, it has a bit of. But yeah. you know, coming back to you know a more modern context, Srini just talked about certain words which are right. becoming yes. so acceptable and are used in daily parlance. Right. And you know, yeah. do you think Shakespeare is really turning in his grave now? No, 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 absolutely not. That kind of a reading, I would say, is a, is a kind of a reductive reading. Uh, Shakespearean, uh, you know, texts uh, will never, uh, you know, uh, uh, will be having a kind of any kind of negative impact, despite whatever be the, you know, the new modalities uh, which may uh, turn up in language. But the point which is really pointed out is very, very important. Do you, see, bullshit was a word which was commonly used when, uh, you know, in that. We are using 80s. a lot of 1980s. horrible words today on this conversation. Yeah, but in 1980s, <laughs> in 1980s, when we when we used to say bullshit, you know, there was some kind of a negative connotation that was attached to that. Brows but, were raised, yes. Yeah, but gradually it became, you know, uh, totally popular. Um, let us go back to this most commonly used word which Srini was talking about. I was reading a text by uh, Reinaldo Arenas, a Cuban writer who was using this word in a, he, instead of saying crucifixion, he says crucifucking fiction. Crucifixion, fucking fiction, which is, which is a kind of an attack against a kind of peculiar regime. Uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, uh, Arenas, uh, you know, being, he died of AIDS, uh, he, was, he belonged to a dissident sexuality, who, so he really wanted to puncture this English language by saying it's not crucifixion that is happening, but it is a kind of a crucifucking fiction which is against the Castro regime. All right, so uh, we can't negate the fact that, uh, you know, these uh, words have become a common usage. And I don't think that we have to... Uh, and you're saying it does not speak ill of the society that we are uh, progressing? The, if, if you're talking about the concept of illness of the society, uh, then we also need to talk about the purity of the society. I would further ask a question that was a society ever pure? The concept of purity of the society itself is a very, very facile and fallacious concept. Was, were we, were we uh, you know, that kind of pure people, the pure, in that case we have to say that we always have been using even in our, in, in our uh, you know, other native languages like, a pu the purity of language is nothing but it's a kind of a fallacious question. You know, like The purity of language is nothing but, Srini, your last comments. Yeah. We're uh, talking uh, of the purity of must, language. We must first wish uh, Shakespeare on his 450th <laughs> birthday today. Right. Happy birthday. Happy yeah. birthday, yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, two points I want to make. One was that uh, a lot of uh, students today have had no exposure to Shakespeare whatsoever. Yes. Uh, and I think that's, that's a huge loss. It's a significant loss in what we call the repertoire you know, of literature, literary references, literary styles. You know? And I think Shakespeare should uh, should probably uh, make a comeback. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The other other point of um, uh, the point that Krishna made. Uh, yeah. I mean, the society. I mean, we probably cannot view a society in that uh, moral framework. Who sets that moral framework? All right, Srini, we are, we are running out of time. Let me just, uh, you know, we cannot view society in that moral framework. Let me just uh, stop you right there and get a final comment from Dr. Poonam. 
Are you worried? You seemed worried at the beginning yes. of the conversation. You seemed worried about the English language and where it's going. Yes. Are you still worried after listening to Srini and the uh, professor? Yes, <laughs> because I think uh, no, when we are talking about English, we should really, uh, whosoever is using the language should consider the platform they are using it at. Whether the platform is important, whether yes. it's literature, whether it's SMS, whether it's Twitter, you're saying yes. the platform and is important, it's very nice word. And there has to be a demarcation. Is Definitely, that, 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 saying, that right? is the need, yes. All right, that's the need. Demarcation is the need, sensibility, you're catering to different sensibilities. All right, what about you, Professor, last comments? Um, well, I slightly disagree with what Poonam says. Uh, I don't think that we don't have to, we, we have to go for a strict and, you know, straight jacketed demarcation. Because sometimes we, f we find that, you know, these demarcations is, uh, is a very, very, why do we have to create a kind of a big wall, like a child. Let wall. language just be as it is, you yeah. know, something to express. Exactly, it. this is, yeah, this is exactly, because we can't change, uh, you know, the, the new modalities and the new, uh, you know, big wind which is coming up. <laughs> All, right, All right, because there is, a, there is a text in our time which is called uh, the philosophy of bullshit. Right, right. You know? the philosophy yeah. of bullshit. All yeah. right, but Professor, uh, I, I must, uh, uh, you know, these were uh, your last comments. I'm sorry, we're running out of time, but I think it was a very interesting discussion. Uh, and uh, Srini and the professor don't seem too perturbed with the fact that, you know, uh, we are saying you instead of bio, you. You're not too perturbed. You're concerned, but not too perturbed. Dr. Poonam, of course, thinks that there has to be a demarcation. Well, on I that actually, note. Actually, I deal with academic. Academic. Uh, so un un undoubtedly. Yes. Undoubtedly. Thank <laughs> you so much, all of you, for joining in on this conversation. Uh, your tweets are awaited. And don't forget, we have a game uh, going on on uh, this site, uh, India Post Live. It's called uh, uh, The Vote race please play the game it's a lot of fun during election time it's a lot of fun to play the game do play the game and i'm waiting for your tweets and your comments on this topic thank you so much for joining bye, -bye.